welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we are sticking our noses in royal business to check out the top 10 ancient pharaohs that committed crime. So, this is a super niche category to discuss, and it's kind of split between things we perceive as illegal now, but weren't actually illegal then, and things that are definitely illegal now, and were also illegal then. The best example of this is One White Ticket. If you've watched some of our other pharaoh videos before, you may know the reason their tombs are so packed full of art and treasure, but also carriages and beds and forks and snacks. Genuinely just random living equipment is because the Egyptians ran on the belief that after death, you continued to live life. So you need all the stuff that you had in your regular life if you wanted to maintain your comfort and not have to rebuy or rebuild everything. So if you're an everyday person, yeah, they may toss your toothbrush and your teddy bear in there, but pharaohs were used to a more personal, larger commodity. People, servants and concubines and serfs, all of these people were considered possessions as well. So if the pharaoh died for a super long time, they'd quite literally mass kill his whole staff and toss him down there in his tomb. For example, one of the very first rulers, King Aha, supposedly died after being gored to death by a hippo. To accompany Aha to the afterlife, some courtiers, retainers, and slaves downed poison and were buried with him. Sometimes, if the rumor is true, these peoples would also simply be sealed into the tombs alive. Vice to say, crime. Very big crime. Very big crime, 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 crime. While that wasn't a big deal then, however, the Trishrata agreement violations was. Trishrata, the king of Mitadani, who was another close ally of Egypt's, had given his daughter's hand in marriage to Akinsaten, the father of Amenhotep, aka King Tut. Upon his father's death, the young pharaoh married the Mitadani princess as well, making her one of the lesser wives. Let's be real, Nefertiti had homeboy's heart, soul, and boys in a chokehold. Trishrata sent Akhenaten many letters to protest the fact that he never received the agreed upon bride price of solid gold statues and instead had only been sent gold plated wooden ones. Cheapos. The pharaohs didn't avoid all diplomatic matters, just ones they didn't personally entrust him. His attention was primarily focused on religious reform and life within his palace. This Persian pharaoh was a known prick and animal hater. The Persian son of Cyrus the Great, after Cambyus' nation conquered Egypt though, he was put in charge of that country. And so he was the ruler of Egypt and apparently someone who hated animals. This is the psycho who strapped cats onto shields to gain entry into Egypt, put on fights between lion cubs and puppies, and once killed the sacred apis bull, a literal crime in ancient Egypt punishable by death. When Cambyses returned to Memphis after an unsuccessful military campaign in the south, Apis's new reincarnation happened to appear in Egypt the same day, which is a massive call of celebration. When Apis appears, the Egyptians all at once don their best clothes and they hold a festival. Seeing this, Cambyses is convinced they're celebrating his misfortunes, so he summoned the rulers of Memphis and demanded to know why the Egyptians were behaving this way. They answered that a god had appeared and it was custom for Egyptians to rejoice that occasion? Cambyses is unconvinced though and claims they're lying and has them put to death. He then next summons the priests who told him the same thing when he asked. He replied that if a tame god had come to Egypt, he would know about it. Then he ordered the priests to bring Apis before him, which they stupidly do. When the priests lead him in, Cambyses draws his dagger and stabs the bull. Laughing at their screams of horror, he said to the priest, are these your gods, fools of flesh and blood who can feel the bite of iron? This is a fitting god for Egyptians, but I will teach you to make a laughing stock of me. He then ordered all the priests swift and any other Egyptians celebrating to be killed. So the festival ended and the priests were punished and Apis lay in the temple until it died and they had to secretly bury it. This was arguably kind of a crime, kind of not. It's Cleopatra, sibling annihilator. And she is nowhere near the only one. Egyptian pharaohs loved to smoke their own siblings, kids, nephews, to, to ensure any kind of throne claim. That's why, yeah, it was a crime, but who's gonna do something about that, and what can you do that won't make you the next coup victim yourself? Power grabs and murder plots were as much a Ptolematic tradition as inter-sibling marriage, and Cleopatra and her brothers and sisters were no different. Her first sibling husband, Ptolemy the Bajillion ran her out of Egypt after she tried to take sole possession of the throne. And then the pair later faced off in a civil war that she won by shacking up with Uncle Caesar. Ptolemy then drowned in the Nile. Following the war, Cleopatra married her younger brother and she is believed to have killed him not long after as the marriage was just to ensure her and Caesar's son, Caesarian, was next in line. In 41 BC, she also engineered the death of her sister, Aronso, who was considered a rival to the throne. So yeah, I'd say a bunch of killing coups 
That's a crime. Nothing like a klepto gaslighter king, though. Amasis's crime was literally being a petty thief. Absolutely zero yard cred for that one. Dude was a raging alcoholic, nympho, and made it to the throne by being sent to calm down a rebellion, but instead chose to join it and lead it, overthrowing the pharaoh and earning him his throne. Ever a master of tact, he sent the king his declaration of war by actually lifting his leg and farting and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He's that guy. But what was most hilarious, at least to me, was the fact he's a kleptomaniac that would steal his friend's stuff, then put it in his house, invite those friends over, intentionally bring them to the room where the item was, and then try to convince them that they'd never owned it in the first place once they'd seen it. This is the single most frat boy personality I've come across in ancient times anywhere, and it's glad to know that it actually does come from somewhere. By making religion illegal, he was defying the laws of the gods, Akhenaten's monotheism. Intentionally erased from history until the 19th century, Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten established the first known monotheistic religion called Atanism, which was rediscovered in the late 18th century and integrated by the 19th and 20th centuries religious philosophers into the histories of the three Abrahamic religions. During Akhenaten's first years as pharaoh, he did recognize the existence of other gods, even though Aten was his primary patron deity. There exists iconography from early Akhenaten's reign, where he was still Amenhotun of Aten, and that includes images of the other solar gods. However, those scenes of Aten sharing space with other gods soon disappear in later depictions, and some of these iconographs of Aten, alongside other deities, are defaced a few years later after their creation. Additionally, any mention of Akhenaten's old name, Amenhotun, was also hacked out. Akhenaten would eventually officially proclaim that Aten was the one and only god, and he condemned the worship and or acknowledgement of any other deity, going so as far as to remove their names and effigies. This actually led to Ak's condemnation of memory, a practice reserved for scrubbing unlikable people from history. By imposing these laws, he defied the universe's laws and those unspoken of freedom of religion in them. Womp womp, y'all ain't gonna like this one. It's Puppy Mills. Very legal, as they should be your reminder to please go to the SPCA and a charity and adopt one of those adult animals or rescued baby animals rather than financially feed a puppy or kitten male because you want a fancy breed. But back in ancient Egypt, they were not only incredibly necessary, but also, well, come a dog. Is it okay to use that right now? In Saqqara, researchers have discovered burial sites filled with a huge number of mummified animals, nearly 8 million of them, and most of them are dogs. The catacomb in particular is one dedicated to the jackal-headed god Anubis, who represents the afterlife. Archaeologist and Egyptologist Salma Ikram writes that the animal mummification began in ancient Egypt to allow beloved pets to go on to the afterlife as well, to provide food in the afterlife, and to act as offerings to a particular god. Nowadays people go to church and they light a candle when they wanted some godly handouts, but the Egyptians were in for the long haul. One little flame isn't enough, so instead they would offer a mummified dog. To get a mummified dog, well, Ikram says the huge number of mummified dogs implies, if not completely confirms, the existence of ancient Egyptian puppy mills. As quote, you don't get 8 million mummies without having puppy farms, and some of these dogs were killed deliberately so that they could be offered. So for us, that really seems heartless, but for the Egyptians, they felt that the dogs were going straight up to join the eternal pack with Anubis, and so they were going off to a better thing. 2,000 years later, Alex is facing his crimes. During his stay in Egypt, Alexander the Great was proclaimed the new pharaoh. He received historic titles associated with the position, such as the son of Ra and beloved of Amun. Whether Alexander also received the elaborate coronation ceremony at Memphis, however, is debated. But what won't be is him being on this list. Fight me all. Although he was in control of Persia by 330 BC, a very drunk and very angry, he stripped royal treasuries as he went through the country and captured Persia's capital, Persepolis, burning it to the ground in a final act of revenge against Persia with all the treasures inside. Alexander the Great's Macedonian army then pillaged the city, destroyed the palace complex, killed almost every single civilian, and then violated and stole the women. So, 2,377 years later, on the 26th of October 2022, Alexander the Great stood trial for war crimes at the UK Supreme Court. He was charged with four count a violation of laws and customs of war during the raising and conquest of Persepolis. The prosecution argued that Alexander was a war criminal who committed atrocities at Persepolis as a deliberate political act. The defense argued that the burning of Persepolis was not politically motivated, rather it was merely tragic consequence of his drunken behavior. And shockingly, the jury acquitted him on all four counts of war crimes. 
The verdict surprised Lord Legat, the Supreme Court justice presiding, after the jury chose to judge the defendant by the standards of his own time rather than the modern customs of war and the annual classics for all moot trial. I cannot help but feel some regret that you found deliberate extermination and enslavement not to be war crimes, but so be it, Legat said. Now for something that was a Grecian no, but in Egypt it's a yeah, sibling relations. So it, the Egyptian pharaohs wouldn't be breaking any crimes, but with the Polytamic dynasty when they came in, they were Macedonian Greeks from a land where it was very much a crime to be doing some stuff with your siblings. It's also very much a crime by today's standards everywhere but Alabama. So The Ptolemies adopted this practice from the Egyptians whom they would conquered, although this would ironically exclude the native Egyptians. The tradition of sibling marriages appears to have begun with Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who married his older sister Arsenio II. The epithet Philadelphus actually means sibling lover, but they kept it clean. It wasn't until the union of Ptolemy III and Arsenio III that this custom of interfamily marriage resulted in the first birth of an heir. All earlier heirs to the Egyptian throne in the Ptolemaic dynasty had been from the side wives. As noted by historian Sheila L. Agar, the Greeks clearly believed that interfamily relations were repugnant not only to the gods, but to all right-thinking individuals. Given that the Greek literature sees it as one of the greatest taboos, things did not turn out well for Oedipus after all. There has been a protracted scholarly debate as to why the Ptolemies engaged in it. One of the primary explanations is they were influenced by the local culture. However, the practice of sibling marriage may have also bolstered their legitimacy as authentic pharaohs in the eyes of their Egyptian subjects. Despite this, even though other Greek families had moved to Egypt were also marrying cousins, there is a tendency to blame the Egyptians for the Ptolematic you know, issue. Now, it, the insane way in which Cleo learned the toxic limits. Alexandria became a prestigious center of learning and the first medical center of the ancient world. As the last member of the Ptolematic dynasty, Cleopatra inherited the throne, but also the great inclination of the Ptolemies towards medicine and science. Attracted by knowledge of venoms and poison, Cleopatra began to test them on condemned prisoners to see the different reactions produced in the body and found toxic limitations. By tricking or directly for Forcing the prisoners into testing these poisons and mixes, Cleo learned oral poisons would cause disturbances such as painful spasms, nausea, abdominal cramps, and slow ends. She even had set snakes on prisoners in order to compare the major effects of venomous snake bites caused by the various species in Egypt such as vipers or elipids. It has been said that Cleopatra used the cobra to take her own life because it would also make sense in some Egyptian mythology being associated with the sacred uraeus worn by the pharaohs. How However, there are several problems with this theory and some scholars argue when she decided to take her life using the information from testing these poisons, she would use a poison that would make sense that given the possibility to choose the best one to have a quick and relatively pain free death. Alright we have hit the end of our segment, thank you so much again for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more of our content and I'll see you next time.